So, a little bit about supportive living. It goes way back to the care program approach in the early 1990s, which we're pretty much, pretty much I think you're all familiar with that. Um, and there was responsible case managers and care coordinators for people who were in mental health services. Now, the term, I don't know if you're familiar with supported living, pretty much comes from the learning disability model. So mental health are pretty much stealing um, what the learning disability um, people have been doing for a long, long time. Um, and the aim for it was to sort of bridge the gap between what's called domiciliary care, so that's care in your own home, and care homes, and provide a sort of a, a link between the two. As care homes can be sort of viewed as long-term placements, um, service users are more disempowered and de-skilled. Supported living was there to give them more choice, more choice about where they live, and more choice about the people that provide the services to them. Um, domiciliary care has its place, but it isn't quite supported living. Supported living is, um, which we'll get to in a second here. So, how does supported living work? Okay, well first of all, um, the, the people who provide the care do not own the premises, or should not own the premises. There should be four... Um, companies or, or four agencies involved. So you have the person, the landlord that owns the house or the premises or the accommodation. You have the, um, the social landlord that is involved as well. So they manage the property and they look after the property. And then you have the care company that's involved as well. So the care company that's are the people who provide support um, to the service users. And the fourth person or the fourth agency that works with the, the, the service user is of course the community mental health team or the, the commissioning body behind that. So we see the, the care company will work as the registered social landlord. I think I believe that term's dying out now, it's just going to be a uh, registered landlord. And the registered landlord will subject the accommodation from the landlord, if you know what I mean. And the service user therefore has more choice about who provides the services to them. The good thing about that is the service user also has tenancy rights too. So what's the referral process? Okay, well it's very much no different from any sort of referral process that you have into services at the moment. So you have, you get a phone call or you get an email from a care coordinator saying we have this individual, we need you to provide a service to them. So the most important part of this is the assessment process. So you're identifying exactly what this individual needs. And you're talking to the right people. You're talking to the, the MDT, you're having the meetings, you're collecting as much information about that person as possible. Now, I believe some, uh, some local authorities are doing some paper referrals, um, which can be a bit of a pain because you actually don't get to meet people. You don't get to see them, you don't get to meet the people <coughs> working with them, you just see some information on a piece of paper. To me, that never really works that way. Um, so after you've had the meeting with, with the team and you think, yes, we can offer this person a service, um, the, the individual should really visit where they're going to live and have a choice about where they're going to live. Following that, if he's happy or she's happy, the care coordinator meets with the commissioners and says, <coughs> we need some money, please. Um, and hopefully, if that all goes through, funding is agreed, you have to develop that care plan for that individual for the moving on time. So that could be things like transition visits, or day visits, overnight visits, to meet the team, meet the people that are going to be providing the support. Following that, a moving in date and then eventually into the home and the support process begins. 